take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me over to Acts chapter 24 in your Bibles. And uh, uh, next week, I'm going to get back into doing our expository preaching. Yes, sir. I did want to mention one phrase. Uh, Frank over there did say nothing about letting him try, but uh, he said that he said that he his son Alice got engaged yesterday. Wow. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Hey, Amen. That is exciting. Praise. Engaged. When's the when's the uh, when's the big day? Uh, Haven't decided yet. Yeah. He's a very sharp med school, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. All right. Acts chapter twenty four. And again, uh, uh, I apologize. We're going to get back into Second John in the morning services and uh, follow along with uh, Elijah in the evening. But uh, just kind of departed for these last few weeks, and now we're getting back into. Uh, well, not back into it as of yet, but I want to preach a message that uh, that I've entitled "Why I'm an Independent Fundamental Baptist," and I believe it's something that some people don't realize why they are, and they just do it just because, or maybe it's just a church that they found they like, and they don't even understand what's the principles behind it. Why do I believe this? Why do I go there? And things such as that. And uh, you know, some of you commented about my books that I brought up. And uh, before I get into the message here, Brother Willis, he, he inspired me this morning. He brought in a couple books. So I, I decided I want to bring up a couple books as well. And, uh, you know, you read the average book on what it is to be a Baptist, and you know where they want to start? In the 1600s. And they'll try to tie the Baptist heritage back with John Smith, who was an Anglican to begin with, wasn't even a Baptist, and uh, he decided to self-baptize himself, called uh, Say Baptist or a C Baptist or whatever you want to call it, and uh, and they try to tie it back into that due to the you know I'll spare you of the Witsit controversy and all of this, but it's hard to find a good book. Uh, where you can learn all about the Baptist heritage, where we come from. I got this book here, Dr. Phil Stringer. It says, uh, Faithful Baptist Witness. Now, that's a good book, and uh, you can get that. I've been reading through this book here, uh, Contending for the Faith by Fred Morris. So this, this has been a good book about fundamentalism and, uh, and why we're not modernist, and that's a good thing. I got this new book. I uh, just finished this a couple of days ago, Why Baptist by Jim Alter, and uh, that's a good book. If you can get a hold of that, that's fantastic. I, I recommend that any day. And then this uh, good old faithful book that probably Brother Willis and everybody in their household has read, uh, History of the Baptist, Volume 1 and 2. Dr. Spencer made me read this, by the way, in Baptist history class, and uh, so I only read Volume 1, and I spare myself of reading Volume 2, but one day I will, uh, just because I love history. But those, those will tell you why, why we come from. Not the 1600s, but before that, uh, based upon uh, Baptist doctrine and so forth, and we'll get into that. In Acts chapter 24, verses 14 through 16, I want to bring you into the context here. The Apostle Paul, he's, he's been brought to the trial. He's been, he went to uh, Jerusalem to go into worship for, um, I believe it's the Passover. And he went to purify himself, and he, he's going back. And, of course, you remember Agabus and all of the prophets and some of them warning him, Paul, if you go back, guess what? You're going to be imprisoned. And Agabus would say, the man whose girl this is, you're going to be bound. And uh, Paul, you remember him, he says, you know, spare me of all this crying and everything else. He says, if God leads me to be bound, then I... For, for whatever God's will is, that's what I want to do. Whether it's to be bound, whether it's to be persecuted, whether it's to be free, whatever the case may be, I just want to be found in God's will. And he goes over to Jerusalem, and sure enough, some of the Judaizers find him going into the temple. They accuse him of bringing some of the Gentiles into the temple, which was forbidden, and they draw him out. And he begins to try to preach unto them. And of course, there's a great big crowd, and they try to take his life, and they have to save him. And now he's appearing before Felix in Acts chapter 24, and he begins to give a defense. Verses 14 says this. He says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, that's the Judaizers, or the, um, the Israelites, so worship I God and my fathers, believing all things, 
which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to always uh, have a good conscience, void of offense toward God and toward men. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight and just a chance to be able to open up your word and to be encouraged, to be challenged by it. And I ask you, Lord, just to minister to our hearts. And uh, Lord, I'm just thankful. Lord, that I call myself a Baptist. And Lord, more than anything else, I call myself a Christian because of you saving my soul. Not because of just some label, but because of what you've made me. Now I belong to Jesus. And I'm grateful for that, Lord. Thank you for saving me, for eternally securing me, and for sanctifying me by your grace. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I was not brought up in an independent Baptist church. Many of you know this. And uh, I remember back when I was first searching what it was to be a Baptist, I went into the prison there and I told, I told some of the guys that were gathered about, I said, I, I don't even know what it is to be a Baptist or anything else. And uh, I just want to know what the Bible says. And I remember picking up a Bible and I said, well, where do you start with this thing? And you've heard me say this several times where I started in the book of John and read the Revelation and started back over to Genesis and read back over to the book of John. And this was my search as I'm looking for, for, for what the Bible says I ought to be. Not what man says I ought to be, but what God says I ought to be. What the Bible says about salvation, what the Bible says about sanctification. What the Bible says about church and everything that there is to know, I search the Word of God. And uh, I began to look through and uh, to understand what it is to be saved by the grace of God. And uh, I got saved. And, and, and never before in my life did I come up against such persecution in my life uh, of, of people coming up with all kinds of different backgrounds and differences and Jehovah's Witness and, and you name it, they came up against me. But I remember when I was looking to get out, and uh, it, was, uh, it was going to get out January 3rd, 2011, and I talked to an old man, Mr. James Edwards. And he was a faithful man, and he would teach the, the, the Bible studies and Sunday schools and so forth as much as he could get in, and he was over 85 years old during this time. And I remember talking to him one day, and I said, well, you know, I'm getting ready to get out soon. Where should I go? And he says, I got one advice for you. Find an independent fundamental Baptist church. And uh, I told him that I was going to Bean Station, and uh, he told me he would be praying for me. And uh, next thing you know, there in Bean Station, right in front of the campgrounds, was an independent fundamental Baptist church. And a uh, small little church, and I was glad to be a part of it. I remember sitting down, uh, you know, when I was getting ready to preach, and I knew God was calling me to preach preached at a Southern Baptist church of all places, and you've heard stories about that as well. I remember talking to the Southern Baptist pastor who was there and going over with him, and he says, you know, I just don't understand you independent Baptists. I said, well, what don't you understand? He said, you guys don't believe in eternal security. I said, well, yes, we do. And he began to go down this long laundry list of, you don't believe this, you don't believe that. I said, well, yes, we do. We believe those things that you're talking about. And I was convinced that he didn't even know what an independent Baptist was or what a Southern Baptist was or anything such as that. And I believe that so many people are searching. So many people are wondering, what is it to be a Baptist? What is it to be independent? What is it to be fundamental? What is it to be separated? What is it to be any of these things? And uh, so much of the time we get a bad rap because of being so strong and hard-headed and everything else, well, we're to be gracious as well. And uh, I praise the Lord for that. But nonetheless, I want to preach to you tonight about this, uh, what it is to be an independent, fundamental, separated, soul-winning, Bible-believing Baptist. Now, that's a lot to tie up, and there's no way that I can preach this in one sermon, but I want to just hit the basics, if you will, as we get into it for tonight. To be fair... There's only one, one Baptist by name in the Bible. Who's that? John the Baptist. And when we read over in the, in, in the book of Acts and so forth, it doesn't say anything in there where they're called Baptist churches, does it? 
But we understand that when we read through there, there's a lot of practices, a lot of doctrine, a lot of uh, stuff that they call the faith of which we line up with, of which we believe. So it's not that they were called uh, Baptist churches back then, but all Baptists, uh, they were Baptists by conviction in the New Testament. Now I realize that I've just made a bold statement, of course, but Paul says, I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, after the way, and the Apostle Paul begins to preach unto, well, he's, he is preaching, he's trying to win Felix over to the Lord. And he says, this way that they call, and of course, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except for by me. And they said, because I identify with the way, Jesus Christ, now I'm called in the trial because of this heresy, because of the resurrection from the dead. Which, by the way, if they would follow the scriptures, they actually would believe it. But they don't believe the scriptures. And they're not identifying with the way. They are identifying with religion. And Paul begins to separate and delineate himself from all this. And um, Paul begins to make a bold statement back there as he begins to preach unto them Jesus. And he was persecuted for his faith and all Baptists down through the ages, whether it's the 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, all the way down to the present century, all Baptists have been persecuted. In fact, this is the least persecuted of all ages that we've been in. Probably because we're so infiltrated with the world that they don't have to persecute us so much. And uh, it's a shame. In the year 1775, we uh, know that there was a man by the name of Patrick Henry. How many of you know him? Patrick Henry was alive back then, and uh, he was riding into Virginia. Virginia was, uh, I guess, they identified with the Anglican or Episcopal Church. I can't remember which, but they certainly were rising up and persecuting the Baptists during this day and age. In fact, I got a book on my bookshelf about how many of the early Virginian Baptists were persecuted, thrown in jail, beaten, and so forth, and humiliated there in, in, in public. But Patrick Henry, he's going to a trial there in 1775. He's riding into uh, Fredericksburg there, I believe it is, and uh, he's, he's going to stand to a trial. There's a man by the name of Lewis and Joseph Craig they are going to stand trial. There's another man by the name of Aaron Bledsoe. He's going to stand trial. You want to know what they're standing trial for? For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach in full, they preach in free, they preach full of grace and truth, and, and it says they were indicted for preaching the gospel of the Son of God in the colony of Virginia. That is their accusation. Can you imagine that? Early Baptists preaching the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And at the trial, the clerk, he begins to stand up for the trial and begins to read the indictment against him. And he says, these men are being charged for preaching the gospel of the Son of God in the colony of Virginia. Now, that seems unheard of to us. But it wasn't just them. I mean, we could bring up Obadiah Holmes and a lot of the early Baptists who were persecuted. Roger Williams, who was thrown out of Massachusetts. And we start... Rhode Island, my wife would always remind me of that. Rhode Island had the first Baptist. I said, honey, but Virginia came in second with John Leland. I said, so we're up there too. But Patrick Henry had just rode 50 or 60 miles over to the, uh, this courthouse to stand trial along with it, or to hear the trial. And upon hearing this prosecution, the first sentence of which had caught his ears was they were standing trial for preaching the gospel of the Son of God. And when it was finished, the prosecuting attorney had submitted a few remarks, and Henry arose, he reached out his hand, received the paper, and addressed the court, and he said, Did I hear... An expression as if a crime that these men whom your worships are about to try for a misdemeanor are tried or are charged for what? For preaching the gospel of the Son of God. These are his words. He says, May it please your worships, our fathers had left the land of their nativity for a settlement in these American wilds for liberty. 
for civil and religious liberty, for liberty of conscience, to worship their creator according to their con conceptions of heaven's revealed will. And from the moment that they place foot on the American continent seeking an asylum from persecution and tyranny, and from that moment, despotism was crushed. Her fetters of darkness were broken, and heaven decreed that man should be free, free to worship God according to the Bible. Were it not for this, in vain had they been efforts of sacrifices of the colonists. In vain were all their sufferings. In vain was the bloodshed to subjugate this new world. If we, their offspring, must still be oppressed and persecuted, but may it please your worships, permit me to inquire once more, for what are these men about to be tried? Because this paper tells me they're be, to be tried for preaching the gospel of the Son of God. And I like the accusation because he says, hey, this is the fallen Adam's race. And if anybody needs the gospel, it's these men. And he begins to stand up boldly. And to be honest with you, Patrick Henry was not a Baptist. He was not a Baptist. But he boldly defended them. He would stand up so that they might have rights. And John, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all of them, we stand for religious liberties. And I'm grateful for those re religious liberties. And after this, when they, Patrick Henry gave his, uh, his great uh, discernment upon this, his great apology, as you would say, he told the sheriff, he says, please let these men go. And then he quickly wrote off and gave that great speech, give me liberty or give me death. Happened right after this. The Baptists have always been a persecuted people. Always, even to this day. I don't pretend to be an expert in this field, honestly. You know, people have studied a lot more than I have. People have written books on this subject countless times over. That doesn't mean that they all know what they're talking about, by the way. But they've written books about what it is to be a Baptist. You know, the best book on what it is to be a Baptist is the Bible. The Bible tells us in Matthew 16, 18, for it says, For upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, you, you look down through that statement, it, it guarantees me that the church of God, the visible, local, the, the, the autonomous church that you and I know is going to stand from the moment of Pentecost onward, that there's always going to be a church, because the gates of hell shall never prevail against that. Is that what your Bible says? That's what I believe. And these principles have continued onward ever since that time because God has promised that He will guarantee His church until Jesus comes. That's why He gives us the two ordinances. When we look at the Lord's Supper for tonight, He says, Do this, remember it's me, until I come. So everything that we do is because of what the Lord has commanded. And either Christ was lying when he made the statement or he still has churches prevailing in this day and in this age. It doesn't matter what the book says. It matters what this Bible says. And that's what I based my beliefs off of, by the way. Before Augustine started the universal Catholic church, that's where it come from. Before Luther started his church in 1520, the Lutheran church. Before John Calvin started the, uh, the, the Episcopal Church, or actually it was the Presbyterian Church that he started. Before Henry VIII started the Episcopal Church. Before John Brown started the Congregational Church. Before John Wesley started the Methodist Church. Before all of these, we would go back in the beginning of the time where John the, the Apostle would write letters to the seven churches. Ephesus, Pergamos, Smyrna, all the seven churches where were real, physical, local churches during this day and age that he was writing to. It wasn't made up churches. It wasn't a universal church. They were local churches. The Apostle Paul, when he would write to the churches of Galatia, those were real churches that he would start and minister and reach out unto. When we talk about the church of Thessalonica or other churches such as that, these were all local, visible churches churches. Augustine started the Catholic Church. And he started that heresy of the universal church. But it wasn't Baptist. It's interesting in the 17th century 
Holland at William of Orange hired two scholars to study uh, the churches in Holland. And of course, there were countless that were there during this time. And his ideas of separation of church and state and religious freedom had allowed many kinds of churches to operate openly in Holland. This is uh, what I get from this book right here, Phil Stringer, The Faithful Baptist Witness. And uh, you can find this also in the history books. It's written in there as well. But William of Orange there in Holland sent out these two scholars, and he says, I want you to find a church that closely identified, the closest that identified with a New Testament church. I want you to study without partiality, without bias, without you know even what I stand for, without the, what the, the, the ruling people of the day stand for, without what the religious people of the day stand for. I want you to remove all bias and do a completely independent study and come back to me and let me know who is the closest I identify with a New Testament church, the way that Jesus Christ describes it, the way that it was set up with the apostles back in that day. And the answer surprised William of Orange when he came back with the answer, and so was the Baptist churches that closely identified back in that day. And uh, it just blew him away. But I'm a Baptist because of doctrine, because of practice. I'm independent in church policy. Uh, 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 you come up with all these different names, okay? You go across one guy, and he'll come up and tell you, he says, well... What I am is I'm a biblicist. Well, guess what? I am too. I believe the Bible. Just you know, I believe the King James Version Bible for the English speaking people. Some people will come up to you and they say, Well, I'm a separatist. Well, I am too. Because the very word church, ecclesia, is a called out assembly, and I am that. Called out of the world, now I belong to Jesus. So I'm a separatist as well. Some people, well, you, know, you look at the charismatic and they call themselves holiness. Well, I identify with holiness because Christ has called me unto holiness. And so I'm holiness as well. Maybe not the way that the charismatics identify it as, but I'm holiness as well. And I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm this or I'm that or whatever the case may be. Well, I line up with these things just under the biblical definition of what they are. And... Uh, even the fundamentalists. Let's go over to Second Thessalonians chapter two real quick. Fundamentalists is because they believe in the, the biblical doctrine of faith that was once delivered unto the saints in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Again, I know I'm not going to get too far, but that's okay. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Verse 15. The Apostle Paul is writing there to the church of Thessalonica and he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And clearly the Apostle Paul lines up his epistle along with the word of God as authority there. He says, hold fast to traditions which you have been taught. And then go over to Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse six, just down one one chapter. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, not after to the tradition which he received of us. These these would be the fundamentals of the faith, whether we're talking about creation, whether we're talking about the virgin birth, or whatever the case may be, the deity of Christ, all these, the fundamentals. I believe the Bible is to be our guide in faith, in matters of faith and practice. And that's, what we, that's what's in our constitution, our church constitution. You see, I'm not letting a hierarchy determine what I believe. I'm not letting a convention, I'm not letting a church, I'm not letting whatever. The, the Bible is my faith, rule, and practice. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And so whatever the Bible says has to govern my, my behavior is to govern my conduct, is to govern everything that I know about the church, whether it's about the two offices of, of pastor or deacon, or whether, no matter what it may be, whatever the Bible says, it goes. You say, even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, the whole Bible, I just believe it from cover to cover, whatever it says about creation or whatever the case may be. The Catholic Church, you know what they hold above the Bible? Their traditions. 
whatever their tradition say, whatever the Pope says, and then and thirdly, after all that is said and done, then they go to the Bible and say, well, after what the Pope says and what our traditions teach, then we'll go to the Bible, and then whatever that says, if we get all three in agreement, then we'll, and of course they're never in agreement, by the way, purgatory is not in the Bible, then it becomes their rule, their doctrine. If you look at the charismatic church and they would hold the experience over the Word of God. It's well what I feel and, and what I think and, and what I read the other day about uh, this man. He's uh, running there on a treadmill and he, he said, I was listening to this country music CD and, and God spoke to me through that country music CD and I know it was the Word of God because I came under conviction. Well, God didn't speak through that. He speaks through His Word not through some experience. Again, we look at uh, the evangelical church, and, and of course, much of that, you know, they'll come through all these different Bible versions, the NIV, the ESV, the NASB, the whatever you may have, and they'll, they'll come through, and you'll read down through, and they say, this is according to the best scholarship, to the best studies, and the best that we know how, because we're always questioning the Word of God, because it may not be so tomorrow. We might find some new truth that might contradict that, because they don't believe this Word. But I believe every word of it. Because the Bible says it's forever settled in heaven. Thy word, O God, is uh, forever settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. The grass withers, the flower fadeth, but the word of my God shall stand forever. There's not a word that's going to be broken, but all of it's going to come true all together. And we know that the things that's been prophesied is going to happen. We know that God, you know, Christ is going to come for His church. We're going to be raptured out of here according to what the Bible says. We know that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation because of what the Bible says. We know that Christ is going to rule and reign on the throne for a thousand years. God's not done with Israel because of what the Bible says. Not because I had to sit down and contradict and make the Bible line up with what I think that it needs to say in order to get my point across. And it's not a hobby horse. Uh, you just got to go by what the Word of God says. They're pure words. They're preserved words. They're permanent words. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, duly furnished under all good works. Now guess what? Whatever I say, they're not going to be pure words and they're not going to be perfect words, but what God says are pure words and perfect words. And this is what's going to make me perfect. I like this, Psalm 136. He says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So it's not what thus saith the Nicene Creed. It's not what saith the 1689 Baptist Confession. It's not what saith the whatever. You may fill, I mean, fill in the blank is what thus saith the Lord. Because the devil's always trying to contradict what the Bible says, and I believe in the autonomy of the local church. It's for observing the ordinances, for ordaining ministers, for defending the faith, for carrying out the Great Commission. Christ is the head of the church, not some religious hierarchy or convention. I, I looked up the other day who's the ba head of the Southern Baptist Convention. His name is Ed Linton. This guy, he, uh, he pastors the church. In fact, he co-pastors the church. Him and his wife pastor together. Him and his wife preach together. You know, he, he starts out the sermon and she finishes. Sometimes it's the opposite way. You know what my Bible says about women ministers? It's not in here. It's the man who's the head of the church. It was Christ the head of the church. It's man who has the authority that God's given, the God given authority unto. And it's not biblical. I learned that Rick Warren was also a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. You know I didn't know that, Brother Willis. I probably should have figured that out, but I didn't know that. This guy is so far in the heresy, it's ridiculous. He's the one that came up with the term Chrislam. Islam and Christianity put together, that's not biblical. He got in trouble here recently because he ordained three women ministers into the, to, to preach the gospel. You know who just left the Southern Baptist Convention? Beth Moore and all those, I mean, they got out. And they're having all kinds of problems because they're getting involved in so much liberalism, it's crazy. But uh, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. My mother-in-law, she, uh, when she was here, 
she told me, she says, you know, up in Rhode Island, there are Catholic churches every which way. They're just like Baptist churches down here. And she says, you know, when I got saved, the first thing I wanted to do was get away from everything that reminded me of the Catholic church. And she says, you know, all those hierarchies in the Catholic, Catholic church, they reminded me an awful lot about the Southern Baptist Convention, and I knew I wanted to get away from that. Now, I know that uh, not all Southern Baptist people are bad. I understand that. Not all of them are bad. You know, Brother Willis is constantly telling me about uh, uh, Adrian Rogers. He's a good man. I love listening to his preaching. But I don't believe in the, in the Southern Baptist Convention. I don't believe you find a convention in the Bible when you look at it. It's nowhere to be found. I, I search, I look for it, Brother Willis. It's not in there. It's all about local autonomous churches. And uh, it's a matter of doctrinal uh, failure on their part. And I also believe in the priesthood of the believer. And uh, this demands that no priest, organized church ritual, sacraments, ordinances, creeds, anything else can stand between the soul and God. There's one mediator. Who's that? Jesus Christ. That means I don't have to go to a priest to confess my sins. That means I don't have to go through a church in order to be saved. That means I just go through Jesus Christ for everything that I need. I believe in the two ordinances given to the church, and of course we, we understand that baptism symbolizes everything that the Lord uh, has done for us. The baptism by immersion, many churches are not practicing that. Sometimes they give you a choice. Well, you can choose whether you want to be sprinkled, poured, or immersed. Well, you know, my Bible says that Jesus went into the water and straightway came up out of it. You look in Acts chapter 7, when the Ethiopian unit, when Philip was preaching to him, he says, Here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And they go down into the water and then back up out of the water. Why do we do that? Because it's commanded in Scripture. Do therefore and teach all nations, baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, somebody helped me out years ago, and uh, they said, you know, baptism's almost like a wedding ring for a married couple. So it doesn't save you. Just as much as a wedding ring doesn't make you married. But that wedding ring shows that you've been married. Just like baptism shows that you've been saved. Not does it save you, but it's a picture of what Christ has accomplished uh, there upon your heart. Now, it just always stuck with me. And I don't know why, but it did. But uh, it shows us obedience. Of course, that's what Christ commanded. It shows us identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows us submission. Because baptism is the door to church membership. And we're submitting to the church ordinances that's given unto us. And then the Lord's Supper. And of course, you know, we could talk about unity. We could talk about purity. We could talk about the vitality. All these things. But it's commanded by, church, uh, by Christ until the Lord comes. Then I believe in individual soul liberty. Now, I know I'm running out of time here, but it doesn't exempt me from responsibility to God's Word. As I get into it, it tells me over and over again, even as you preached this morning, it says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. No man's ex exempt from it. No man can get away from that. All of us want to stand or fall upon our own two feet. In fact, that's what Paul tells us in the book of Romans, I believe it is. He says, you know, don't judge any man by what they're doing according to their masters, whatever that case may be, whether they're observing a day or whether they're eating the meat or whatever the case may be, it's before God he'll stand or fall. It's before God that he'll have to answer. But let every man be fully persuaded in his own conscience. And so we've got to be fully persuaded, and that's individual soul liberty. And it's one of those things where, even in the book of Revelation, where Jesus said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So Nicolaitans is always the rulers over top of the people that's always persecuted the church. The individual soul liberty. Save, baptized church membership. It's got to be that way. You've got to be saved first. Baptized. You, you know, brought into the church. Of course, you're submitting to it. A lot of people are not coming to church anymore. A lot of people are not identifying with the church anymore. In fact, a lot of people say, I don't even want Baptists on a sign anymore. Well, you've got to understand what kind of church you're going to. There's a lot of confusion out there. When you go into a church, you have to know what they're going to say or what they're preaching from or what, they're, or what you can expect out of them. I want to go to a church that has Baptists on their sign. 
But a lot of people are dropping that. But say you baptize church membership. How else do you want to keep a pure church? And they're not a member of the church. I mean, of course, you can tell them don't come back. But if they're members of the church and they're walking disorderly, you discipline them from the church. And the, the understanding is you want to bring them back with a right heart and be gracious unto them and so forth. Again, the two, believe in the two offices of the pastor and deacon. It's uh, one of the things that blows my mind is I begin to look at different churches. And you, you, you look at them and some of them say, well, I'm a teaching pastor and this is a preaching pastor and this is a children's pastor and this is a this pastor and that pastor and this elder and this elder board and this deacon board and this... The Bible only tells me that there's a pastor and a deacon. And that's it. The pastor is the overseer, the bishop. He is the episcopos. He is the, uh, the, the elder, the ruler, the, the, the shepherd of the sheep, the whole nine yards when it comes to that. And then the deacon to help in the ministration of whatever the needs of the church may be is in Acts chapter 6. So there's only two offices in the church. I know you guys know these, but I uh, also believe in separation of the church. And render unto Caesars what Caesars. Separation of church and state, by the way. Caesars, what is Caesars? What is God is God's? And then uh, the separatist, the ecclesia, and the soul winner. Down through the ages. This is what we're getting away from. And this is really my point. Down through the ages when we look at it. You look at the Baptist believers, they've always been separatists. They wanted to maintain that purity. They wanted to maintain a close, closeness to God, to, to Jesus Christ, and always, whatever it says in the Bible. To always contend for the faith once handed down to the saints, and that once handed down to the saints is once for all. They have all the doctrine that's there. Some of the men who would preach back in that day, they didn't always have it together doctrinally. They were on the run. They were persecuted. And many of them were unlearned men. They would have different colleges, colleges of the Barbie there in Italy and so forth. That's not Barbies like in a Barbie doll, but just a place where they would go and study. And they would copy out the Word of God. and for, They would go and learn and study, and then they didn't expect to have more than a four-year life expectancy after that. That's how persecuted they were. But they wanted to be soul winners. They wanted to be separate from the Catholic Church. And they just wanted to reach people for the glory of God. They weren't mean-spirited. By all means, they were gracious. They loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to demonstrate that same sort of spirit that Jesus had. But they also took a stand for the truth. We're Baptist by conviction because we just believe the Bible. Whatever the Bible says, that's what I stand on. And that's what we strive to do. And what does it say at the end of uh, verse 16 here in our text? Acts chapter 24, verse 16. He says, And herein do I exercise myself to always, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. And he puts God first. He understands that when you take a stand for God, there's going to be some men that's going to be upset with you. But I want to have a conscience clean of offense toward God and toward man. That doesn't sound mean-spirited to me. Paul here, he's pleading the case. He's trying to win this guy over and showing him how to be saved, whether he'll receive it or not. Of course, he's facing persecution and trouble along the way. But he takes a stand for the truth. This is who I am. I'm being persecuted for the way. I'm taking a stand for the way. I'm identifying with the way. And that's what we do as Baptists. You know, does all the labels make me any more of a, a good guy? Does it make me any more godly? No. But it shows you exactly what I believe. I, I don't question the Word of God. I just believe it. So let's just pray as we uh, go into the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time together. And Lord, may you use these feeble words of mine for your glory. Uh, Lord, I know that there's so much confusion in this world. And they say, well, why this and why that? Lord, so many people don't even know what they believe or why to believe it. But help us to be fully persuaded in our own minds. This is just who we are. 
We're not ashamed to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not ashamed to take a stand on the Bible. We're not ashamed to, to walk in the Holy Spirit and to be sanctified and set apart. Lord, we're just trying to be Your servants to do Your will. Help us to be soul winners and separated and do Your will. Lord, we love You in Jesus' name. Amen.